Hear these words from Psalm 66, verses 8 through 20. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, who has kept us among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us out to a spacious place. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows, those that my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer to you burnt offerings of fatlings with the smoke of the sacrifice of rams. I will make an offering of bulls and goats. Come and hear all you who fear God and I will tell what he has done for me. I cried aloud to him, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has given heed to the words of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. The psalmist starts off with what seems to be really good news, praising and prayer to God and celebrating him for what he has done, but very quickly moves into a place that if we as uh, modern day Christians were to take without understanding his words, would see as like a very disparate image. Uh, the psalmist goes from praising God and then goes into you have let people walk over our heads. You have led us into trials. You've led us through fire and through water, through all of the nasty elements. And it seems very incongruous if we take it with our modern understanding of the way that the psalmist is writing. But I think what we need to first analyze about this passage is that the psalmist is not writing in our modern sense of the word, a complaint. He is not saying, God, you have tested me. In other words, you've thrown all of this at me to see whether I'm actually faithful to you and I've gone through all of this terrible stuff and we as a community, a people, have gone through this terrible stuff. Instead, the psalmist is kind of just listing things that have happened. The psalmist understands that even if God doesn't intentionally cause difficulties and trials, it's all under God's control. God sees it, God knows it. It's not happening without God's knowledge or understanding. And so this list of things that God has not only let them experience, but brought them faithfully through is not so much of a, Lord, I've seen you there testing me, but rather we have gone through these tests. You have brought us through and we will be faithful when it's good and when it's not so good. And he goes on to say that the vows that I made while I was in trouble, I will honor those now. We're pretty familiar with that, even as modern Christians. The promises we make when we're in difficult circumstances, oh Lord, I'll do this if you just. Um, we're very prone to that. And David is saying, I will honor those. I won't go, oh, now everything's good. And therefore I'm just gonna ignore what I promised you. So David, uh, or at least the psalmist's voice, which is traditionally understood to be David, is writing of a psalm that, or is writing a psalm that recognizes that God has let us go through difficulty as a people, has brought us through, and that he is worthy of praise even in the midst of difficulty, even knowing that there was difficulty. Because of that, we get a sense that the psalmist understands something deeper about God and about the Christian faith. Understands that the tests that God sends our way aren't tests to prove whether we're loyal to him on his behalf. 
he doesn't send tests our direction just to see, ah, are we actually following him? Are we good Christians? Are we good people? Are we a good nation? But rather tests come our way so that it tests and refines our faith for ourselves. That's why he compares it to the refining of silver. Silver would have been uh, melted down and then burned and then had uh, portions of the metal lopped off the top, the impurities, so that that didn't continue to affect the silver when it was poured into a new mold. But it required heat, it required difficulty, it required a lot of poking and prodding, a lot of modifications. Sometimes there's even chemical treatments that were used. And he compares it to that because he wants to express his understanding that God lets us experience tests not for God's purposes, not so that God sees how faithful or unfaithful we are, but so that we grow and are refined and are um, restructured so that we can better serve God. Another word that's often used in the Bible is honed. And I know I've spoken of this example before, but if you're a person who is a, a cook or a chef and you use a knife, a, a good kitchen knife, you often own a honing steel. And the honing steel goes on the edge of the blade and it does not sharpen the blade, but rather hones the edge, which causes all the little microscopic pieces of metal to line up in one uniform way, rather than being all scattered, like is what happens when you cut something. And so the honing steel smooths those into one fine point so that your knife, even microscopically, is all aimed at cutting in one direction and not disparate directions. And so similar to the way that silver is refined or steel is honed, it purifies us and sets us on a, a refined, a specific angle, a specific task. And it happens more often in our lives, not when things are good, but when things are difficult. Even if you imagine a knife and a honing steel, that's a lot of scraping, that's a lot of, um, there's little bits of steel shavings that are coming off. We usually can't see them, but they are. And that would be, if we imagined ourselves as the knife, that would be rough on the knife. That would be rough on us. Just like if we imagined ourselves as the silver, that would be rough on the silver, that would be rough on us. And yet, it's all for the purpose of us developing our faith, not so that God can see whether we're good enough or not good enough, but rather so we can grow out of those things that kind of seem to rough us up, but do so in order to produce better, refined, more honed people of God. Again, I, I can't say enough about how the Revised Common Lectionary and the scriptures that I have been naturally following have already so easily lined up with what we're experiencing right now. I couldn't have picked really any better scriptures than what was already planned years and years in advance as what has come up during this time. Where are we now? We're in the middle of a trial. No, we're not talking God sent the coronavirus so that we can learn to be better Christians or learn to be better humans. God didn't send it to punish us for bad behavior that we did, but rather we are in the midst of a trial that has happened, that God understands, that God has allowed to happen in his world of free will and is honing us or refining us to be better human beings. Now it's and particularly better Christians. But it's sometimes difficult to see in the midst of this. It's sometimes difficult to see when we see arguments about face masks, no face masks, returning to church, not returning to church, um, opening businesses, not opening businesses. We see that clash going on and it's hard to see how this is beneficial in any way to us as human beings or Christians. But on the other side of it, you see things happening like uh, organizations that normally operate food banks serving two to four times the amount of families that they normally would and getting donations two and four times the amount that they actually would. We see people stepping forward to make masks for free, face coverings, the plastic face shields for free, ear savers to protect the people's ears who have to wear masks for free. We see people who are making um, disposable, not disposable, reusable um 
uh, gowns for hospitals and for nursing homes for free out of the goodness of their heart. We see ministries and companies turning the work that they're doing that they would normally be doing over to working specifically with the difficulties of this virus. We see people who are kinder, who reach out more. We see people who are willing to deliver food to their neighbors, who are willing to do work for the neighbors who don't want to go out or can't go out or are in difficult circumstances. We see this if we pay attention to the news media and we look for the good, we see how this time of trial and testing has produced human beings and Christians that are more refined, that are more guided and more honed along God's path. I'm participating in a virtual choir online. Um, there's been a handful of these done by one particular director over the past 10 years or so. Currently, he has about 20 to 30,000 people signed up to submit videos. And there is a Facebook group that goes along with that virtual choir that's helping us understand sectionals and recordings and, and how you set your settings for your phone and how do you use the music and all of the technical stuff. But also uh, this Facebook group has somewhere between seven and 10,000 members. And I haven't seen a negative comment go by. I haven't seen anybody when someone shares their video and say, is, is this good enough? Say, well, you really could use better intonation or better pitch or the stuff in the background is too distracting or your, you know, your face is ugly or anything like that. They're not using social media to be terrible people. They're using social media to upbuild people and to make sure that they are inspired to share their music instead of defeated as sometimes even some musicians can be kind of prickly people. And I love seeing this in this group in particular because it's reminding me of how these people are coming together in this moment of quarantine, in this time of illness, in this time of sickness from all over the world, 130 some countries and all kinds of backgrounds and being immensely supportive of one another in this music that they're attempting to make outside the normal way that we make music. And I'm reminded of the way that we are refined or we are honed to be stronger humans, better in many ways humans, better Christians, Christians that more closely follow God's expectations for their lives. I'm immensely proud of this organization that I'm part of because they're showing that we, when we're stressed and when we're uh, given contention and when we're presented with problems and when we're not sure of the solutions and, and so many parts of the world just want to fight, there are people out there who are being reassuring, who are being loving, who are being caring. And even though this isn't particularly a Christian group, it's a majorly diverse group, they're embodying the same things God would have us embody in the midst of strife and difficulty. And so when we think of this psalm and we think of the words of the psalmist praising God and praising God alongside this image of God letting things happen, of letting tests of their own abilities come, not for God's building up of his ego or not to say, ha ha, gotcha, you're not a good Christian, but rather so that we are more refined and more honed and more traveling towards God's purpose it is a blessing to see those kind of things happen in the world. So we as Christians by this psalm are challenged to praise God even in the midst of difficulty, but also to see that difficulty as an opportunity to grow more into where God is leading us. As a matter of fact, there was a professor in college who would always say a test isn't a punishment, a test isn't to prove to the professor how good you're doing, but rather an opportunity for you to showcase the knowledge and the learning 
that you have acquired over this time. Rather than seeing tests as negative and frustrating and rah, all that comes with uh, testing in school, rather seeing it as an opportunity to shine. And this is the same way that the psalmist viewed all of the troubles that came the way of the people and the way of him and why he would still praise God and still honor the vows that he had made during those times because he saw it as an opportunity to better showcase what God had taught him and the people during that time. That all being said, it's not easy to see what God is teaching us in the middle of tests and trials, what God is letting us experience, what God is giving to us so that we can showcase our learning and our abilities. It's probably the most difficult thing we're ever going to do is try and find where God and God's spirit are at work in the midst of all of our experiences, let alone the difficult ones. And so my challenge for you this week, particularly as we had talked in the past couple weeks about testimony, my challenge for you this week is to find that space where the Holy Spirit, where God's Spirit is speaking a change, speaking a challenge, speaking a, a refinement into your life because of this situation. Where is God speaking into your life and guiding you in a way that refines you or hones you closer to his his desire for your life, his challenge for your life, his expectation for your life. We as Christians are often a little uh, reticent, a, a little held back to try and uh, decipher and nitpick the things in our lives and try and find where God is because we know we're not very good at it and sometimes we'll mess up and and we might see God and then it's not actually God or we might not see God and then it actually was God and the, that's a skill that really only gets better with with time, with trying, with doing something more and more and more. So my challenge this week for you is to begin to look into this time of challenge, this time of testing, this time of trial, this time of refinement, and see where God is speaking his Holy Spirit into your life for perhaps something that he wants you to, to learn, to discover, to build up in yourself. I know that um, uh, on a personal experience, uh, just the simple challenge of how to uh, better communicate with people over the phone is one of those challenges that God has started to kind of morph in my life. It's been so long since we've used telephone as a regular communication method for a lot of us. And so how do we become better message leavers? How do we become better encouragers when we can't speak face to face? That's something that I have been growing through in this time. And I know I'm not 100% perfect on, but I understand God is challenging me to do. And so we are, if we spend time looking, we are going to find places in our life where this test, this difficulty, this challenge is driving us toward being a different Christian by the time we get out. And not just a different Christian in the way the church services might look when we're done with all of this, but rather a different Christian in how we act, how we react, how we serve, how we give, how we do mission, how we live out God's ministry in our lives. How is that being changed by what we're experiencing? Not just temporarily, but for the permanent future. How is what we're learning and experiencing here going to serve our Christian lives in the future, serve God in the future, serve others in the future? And so this week, I leave you with the words of a psalmist who recognizes the need to praise God for the gifts of the opportunities to show how our faith is growing in the midst of trial, to focus on the places in our lives, the beauty that God has truly 
challenged us to find in our lives in the midst of this crisis so that we can better move toward his kind of perfection, his expectation for where we will be as Christians in our future. And so this week, I encourage you to take the words of the psalmist and to understand that God is not punishing us for anything we've done. God isn't testing us on his behalf, but rather letting us experience the difficulties of life, the refining of the silver, the honing of the steel, so that we see him moving in our lives and become Christians that are ever closer to his mission and ministry. Blessings on the week ahead. I call down all the praise of God on you as you embark on your mission of learning this week. Amen.